District Court of Appeal is now in session. All who have business before this court draw near, give attention, and shall be heard. May God save these United States, the great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the First District Court of Appeal. We have two cases on the docket this morning, and we'll take them in the order as listed on the schedule. Our first case is White versus Discovery Communication et al. Uh, that is case number 221321. Uh, Counselor, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. I'm Joe Little from Gainesville. I, along with lead counsel Charles Barfield, represent Appellate White uh, in this matter. I request five minutes for rebuttal by uh, Mr. Barfield. Five minutes, so noted. Thank you, Professor. Go ahead. Appellate White is a poor, uneducated black man who lives in peaceably in Franklin County, Florida. He's never murdered anyone and never been in the New York state. Appellee's Microsoft is a billion dollar global company with many functions. Among them is selling and streaming television programs from its platforms to purchasers and subscribers throughout the United States, including Florida and the world. This is a direct sales activity that is not regulated by the Communications Decency Act that I'll refer to as the DCA. Microsoft directly streamed and published the defamatory television depiction of Appellate White as a serial killer in an episode uh, known as Quote, I invited him in. <clears throat> Microsoft directly published this defamation in Florida, nationwide, and globally. Microsoft also published the defamatory depiction through its Bing search engine in a manner that does not invoke CDA immunity. Appellate adduced positive evidence of Microsoft's direct TV publications that are not immunized by CDA. And the trial court completely ignored it to grant Microsoft's motion for summary judgment on the grounds of CDA immunity. Well, can, can I ask you about that? The, 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 we've got the affidavit, which is, is questioned from, from Mr. White because it's not sworn. Uh, but besides the affidavit, where is there record evidence uh, showing that uh, Microsoft uh, published the, uh, the, the, the allegedly defamatory uh, program? Uh, Your Honor, we, we, we have several um, matters of evidence that I will refer to you. Uh, on, in, on the record in page 313 is a letter from Microsoft to Discovery LLC, which states, quote, Microsoft began under undertaking efforts to prevent viewers from accessing the episode titled, quote, I invited him in, unquote, from se season four of the Evil Lives Here series through any of Microsoft's platforms. Microsoft's request that Discovery remove the episode from availability for online digital streaming and or notify all its licensees uh, or affiliates that the episode be removed. This so, is so it's your contention that if you have, you, you host a website, you're like Microsoft, you host a website and you take some information in from a third party, if you pull that information off of your website, that makes you a publisher of it? No, we're not saying they pulled it off his web website. We're saying they streamed it into Florida, which is different from pulling it off a, a website. Well, where, where's, and that raises an interesting question. Where's the record evidence besides Mr. White's affidavit that it was streamed into Florida? It was streamed. Your Honor, Microsoft is a global company. Let me let me read you some other evidence here. Uh, Microsoft, Mr. White requested Microsoft to admit this. 
Microsoft offered for sale the episode. I invited him in in the series Evil Lives Here in the United States or Globally. And Microsoft responded that the episode at issue was available to be downloaded from the link that Mr. White uh, had provided him. But to publish it, doesn't, it, doesn't somebody in Florida have to actually receive it? Yes. The, the fact that it's available out there is not enough. There's got to be record evidence that somebody got it, right? And where's that record evidence? We, we have evidence in the record of these cases that these, the episode was received and seen by viewers in Florida, Your Honor. Microsoft, we don't know how many uh, viewers they have in Florida, but presumably thousands. And we know it was streamed for, for months, years. But, but under my understanding, under Doe v. AOL, Florida requires for it to come into Florida for there be the defamation, for the defamation to occur in Florida, somebody actually has to See. Take, take hold of it in Florida. Yes. Right? So w is there any other evidence besides Mr. White's affidavit that that occurred? In this case, Your Honor, we may not have that evidence in the record. But in the other cases, we certainly do have that evidence. Uh, in the record. Um, Appellate White requested Microsoft to admit this. The episode I invited him in in the series Evil Lives Here in the United States or globally was sold by Microsoft from its website or websites, including included the image of, of Plaintiff White. And Microsoft responded. Microsoft admits that the image a plaintiff white is displayed briefly during the episode described uh, in the request. In some, Your Honor, the, the evidence is that Microsoft was streaming this program throughout the United States, and that includes Florida, and globally, for a long period of time. Microsoft undertook to tell us that we're taking it all down. We're not streaming it anymore. Uh, and, you, Your Honor, I don't know why that's not sufficient for, an, for a jury to determine that, in fact, the matter was viewed and seen and streamed into Florida. Can I ask you, before we burn through all your time, on, uh, I think it was in the reply brief, there was mention of this Gonzalez versus Google case in yes, the sir. U.S. Supreme Court uh, dealing with 230. What, what bearing does that have on uh, the, the summary judgment here? Your Honor, it, in, in our opinion, it has no bearing on the direct publishing theory, which is not covered. Direct streaming by television into the state is not covered uh, by CDA. It has to be posting something on a website that is covered. Now, on that point, that's our second argument is <clears throat> that Microsoft used its Bing search engine to search out images of uh, Mr. White, depicting him as a serial killer, and delivered them to its users. Now, Microsoft says that's covered by CDA, and that was the basis that the court, I think, may have. We don't know exactly why the court did what the court did. Uh, but that's the very issue that's at, uh, at issue in the Gonzalez case. There, the Supreme Court of Florida, and that case was heard in October by the Supreme Court of Florida, and it has not been decided yet. At least I, I checked yesterday, and it had not yet been decided. Uh, but the Supreme Court is going to decide whether that, I think, will decide whether or not that activity and our second theory is, in fact, uh, immunized by CDA. We respectfully argue that it should not be immunized because this is not a case where Microsoft sit, uh, simply set up a website and said anybody who wants to post something on our website, have at it. 
That's a case like in the Giordano case and the AOL case in Florida that the courts have held uh, is immunized by CDA because it's somebody else making use of the Internet put up by Microsoft. In either event, whether it's the streaming uh, argument or the search engine argument, um, in order uh, under 230 to be considered a publisher, uh, don't they have to participate in the creation or the development of the content? And I, not, Your Honor, if we're just streaming television, such as comes over Cox Cable or through your telephone lines, no, Your Honor, that's not covered by CDA, CDA because that, that's not the Internet. The Internet is something different uh, from the, the direct streaming of a product such as you've described. Uh, so the direct, direct screening is not a CDA-covered matter. It's the Internet where somebody puts up a, a website such as the Giordano case uh, and uh, somebody else comes and puts something on that website that is defamatory. Yours, this case has to be reversed on procedural grounds. The court made a conclusory statement <clears throat> that there's no dispute of a material fact. The Supreme Court said that is not sufficient. The Supreme Court mandated trial courts to give a basis in reason for their arguments, and this, the court didn't do it. So the court ought to reverse on that ground alone, and if they require the uh, uh, circuit court to examine the evidence and make a decision on the evidence. And Thank we're, you. we're into your rebuttal time, but we'll give you a, a little more time on this, because I, I want to ask you about that second point. The, the new rule 1.510A says the court shall state on the record the reasons for granting or denying the motion. At the uh, hearing and then also in her written order, uh, Judge Dempsey said there's no dispute of material fact uh, such that, uh, you know, the case can go forward, so I'm granting the motion. W why is that not enough under the, the revised rule? Well, the Supreme Court has said specifically uh, this, <clears throat> to comply with this requirement, it will not be enough for the court to make a conclusory statement there is, that there is or not a genuine, genuine dispute as to material fact. The court must state the reasons for its decision with enough specificity to provide useful guidance to the parties and if necessary for allowing appellate review on court. That's in the, the uh, decision which the court adopted. Uh, the rule and it's been quoted by the third district and the fourth district, reversing, reversing decisions such as the one uh, that this court has before it. In other words, the court must say, I have examined the evidence and because of this examination, I find that the, the uh, the complaint or the case is defective and must be uh, dismissed. The court didn't do that, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we'll reserve the rest of your time for rebuttal, and we'll give you two minutes more uh, for your rebuttal, and same for uh, the appellees during their presentation. Good morning, and may it please the court, Catherine Clemente on behalf of Microsoft. The trial court correctly granted summary judgment under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act because Microsoft was not the information content provider for the episode or web pages for which plaintiff seeks to hold Microsoft liable. Section 230C1 broadly mandates that, quote, no provider of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. On appeal, plaintiff's submissions do not address the Section 230 prongs individually, but it is apparent that plaintiff does not dispute two of the three. Uh, first, that Microsoft is an interactive computer service, and uh, second, that plaintiff is seeking to hold Microsoft liable 
uh, as a publisher of third-party content. Uh, as we understand the initial brief then, the sole question on this appeal, as it relates to the summary judgment order, is whether Microsoft materially contributed to the alleged illegality of the episode or web pages. The record demonstrates that it did not. There are two buckets of content, as my adversary noted, uh, for which plaintiff seeks to hold Microsoft liable. First are the eight web pages that we understand plaintiff may have accessed following a Bing search. Uh, and the second is the episode itself, allegedly accessed through online streaming on Microsoft's platforms. First, as to plaintiff's web pages or search engine theory of liability. Uh, search engines are neutral tools. Uh, they do not create content, but rather serve content to users upon request. Uh, plaintiff seemingly understands this. Uh, he conceded at his deposition that he does not know Microsoft to have authored any of the web pages in the record at 212 through 213, but regardless, uh, the web pages themselves uh, demonstrate that they were authored by various third parties, not Microsoft. In his initial brief, plaintiff only raises error with one of the eight web pages, the US serial killer addresses website, which was authored by an anonymous poster called, quote, the feral blue chicken, that's the record at 194 through 195, uh, not Microsoft. Uh, plaintiff has waived any argument as to the other seven web pages. Second, as to plaintiff's streaming theory of liability, uh, as we note in our brief, we believe that this argument has been waived as plaintiff failed to plead it or raise it in his summary judgment response, which is in the record at 382 through 397, as required by Rule 1.510C and the Lloyd S. Measles case. Plaintiff only argued for the first time at the summary judgment hearing that Microsoft is liable because it allegedly sold the episode through online streaming access uh, that is insufficient for preservation under the amended rule. Either way, uh, the trial court was only required to consider the cited record materials in entering summary judgment under Rule 1.510C, and plaintiff's summary judgment response cited nothing. But even if this court determines that plaintiff preserved this argument, it is undisputed that Red Marble Media produced the episode and that Discovery broadcast it. Discovery admitted that Red Marble produced the episode that's in the record at 149. Uh, plaintiff admitted in his complaint and his deposition, uh, the complaint at record 27, uh, that Red Marble and or Discovery is the information content provider uh, responsible for the episode um, in his deposition, that's 212 through 213 of the record. Uh, plaintiff also testified that he did not understand Microsoft to have had any hand in the production of the episode, same site. Uh, plaintiff failed to allege in the complaint or adduce any evidence to show that Microsoft was involved in any way in the creation or development of the episode. The fundamental legal question we submit um, is whether Microsoft provided the specific information for which plaintiff seeks to hold li Microsoft liable. Here, the choice to include plaintiff's photo at the end of the episode. Plaintiff's streaming argument does not provide a basis for reversal as Microsoft did not prov uh, provide the content of the episode. Can, can I ask you, the, um, the in-right uh, Facebook case from Texas was mentioned, and I thought that was an interesting case. Uh, are, are you aware of any Florida courts uh, going as far as the Texas Supreme Court did there in uh, immunizing under 230 Facebook? We are not aware of a Florida court that went that far. But um, Your Honor mentioned the Doe v. America Online case earlier. And what I think bears mentioning here under plaintiff's sort of evolving theory of liability is that in that case, uh, the Florida Supreme Court spent a lot of time discussing the history of the statute and found very persuasive some of the case law leading up to it. So one of the cases that uh, the Florida Supreme Court discussed at length is a case called Cubby Inc. v. CompuServe. It was an SDNY case from 1991, so it predates the CDA. Uh, but 
and this is quoting from the Florida Supreme Court's opinion, uh, 783 Southern 2nd at 1014. Uh, in that case, quote, the federal district court held in a defamation action that CompuServe, a service provider that offered its subscribers access to an electronic library of news publications, was a mere distributor of information and could not be held liable for libelous statements made in those news publications. Uh, without a showing of actual knowledge, it went into the defamation standard again because we didn't have CDA immunity yet. But Congress, in enacting the statute, pointed to this case as a good result, as opposed to some of the cases that Congress explicitly overturned with the enactment of the CDA. So we have an idea from Doe v. America Online that simply providing access to third-party content through a library like this, much like, like streaming, is immunized in this state. Uh, For the purposes of, um, so you have kind of two prongs under 230. You have uh, the, uh, the content uh, creation or development piece, but then uh, you also have to be an interactive computer service, right? And so uh, certainly um, Microsoft has aspects of its business that w would be fairly considered an interactive computer service, but there may be aspects of its business that wouldn't. Um, so how should we think about this, in, 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 particularly with regard to the streaming aspect of it? Is um, providing a streaming service, is that really uh, an interactive computer service? Is that really a place where third parties can come and post information and uh, third party content in the way that um, maybe the interactive service, computer service uh, provisions contemplate? Uh, we contend that it does. The, an interactive computer service is, and I'm reading from my notes here, it's something that enables computer access by multiple users to a computer server. Um, and I believe it's either the roommate's case or the Jones case from the Sixth Circuit that explains that this is most commonly a website. And so a website is the medium through which plaintiff alleges that he accessed the streaming content. So regardless of the fact that it is a streaming video, it is still being accessed through an online platform. And so I have to respectfully disagree with my adversary that this is akin to television broadcasting, because it's not. It's a different medium. If this were broadcast on television through the traditional medium, the CDA wouldn't apply. So the distinction is just, um, so appellant talks about you know the cable coming into the house. It comes in uh, in a traditional cable format, uh, and uh, there are Certainly, there's content that you can get that way, and then you can get the very same content via a streaming service, maybe a parallel streaming service uh, via the internet, maybe an internet that runs over the same cable even. Um, but that's the distinction that you're pointing to? It's how it uh, gets there? Well, the distinction I'm pointing to, that, that is sort of the distinction that I'm pointing to, but it's also sort of the, the decision that Congress made here um, in providing immunity for online service providers as opposed to traditional print media or traditional television broadcast. Uh, this is sort of the bargain that was struck in the 90s uh, you know, with this broad immunity, not understanding that they couldn't necessarily foresee uh, how the internet would develop. Um, but so long as it is being accessed through an online service provider, uh, traditional publishing functions are immune so long as uh, the publisher has not create, uh, contributed to the creation or development of the content. Um, and to that point, the, the case law is clear that where a defendant's role is strictly one of output control, uh, its, act, its action constitutes the very essence of publishing and is immune. That's the Bennett case from the DC Circuit. Uh, there is no creation or development where the website does, quote, absolutely nothing to enhance the defamatory sting of the message, to encourage defamation, or to make defamation easier. That's the roommate's case from the Ninth Circuit. And then uh, finally, a, a website operator is not, quote, responsible for the development of content created by a third party, party merely by displaying or allowing access to it. That's the Jones case in the so, Sixth Circuit. <clears throat> How does Microsoft's decision to pull the episode from platforms 
relate to its liability then? So uh, I would submit that that is a traditional publishing function. It is an editorial function that is immunized by the statute. Um, I believe that the initial brief um, sort of collapses two of the Section 230 prongs such that publishing and information content pro providing are uh, melded together, but they're different. And so, so long as Microsoft did not provide our, the underlying content, uh, material con contributed to its alleged illegality, um, its decision to place or remove that content is immune. Um, it's sort of the essence of Section 230 immunity. Can, can I ask you a question I ask the appellant? Uh, the, the Gonzalez versus Google case that's up at the Supreme Court, uh, I have not read the numerous briefs and probably uh, Amici briefs on that. Does that have any bearing on what we're doing here today? I, I don't believe so. Uh, it's a very narrow question presented in that case, if I may. I have it right here. Does Section 230C1 immunize interactive computer services when they make targeted recommendations of information provided by another information content provider? or only limit the liability of interactive computer services when they engage in traditional editorial functions, such as deciding whether to display or withdraw with regard to such information. Uh, the targeted recommendations of information in that case, from what I recall, has to do with um, Google's pairing of content or suggesting content uh, of dealing with ISIS's uh, YouTube channel, mm -hmm. including advertisements. So it's, it's quite a narrow case. It also went up on a motion to dismiss. Uh, so we submit that the universe of case law um, and the statute itself is enough for this court to affirm. Thank you. Can, before we get through all your time, can I ask you about this, the second argument that appellant makes on the, uh, the order? Uh, from uh, Judge Dempsey uh, uh, allegedly being insufficient under the revised 1.510. Uh, how do you respond to that? Uh, my response to that is is the, the trial court did not simply say there is no genuine issue of material fact such that um, Microsoft is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Uh, the trial court said, and here it is, uh, final order 373 through 374. Uh, the court ruled Plaintiff's claim against Microsoft, I'm quoting from 374 now, plaintiff's claim against Microsoft is barred by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act and then cited the statute. So the reason was provided there. And there's nothing in the amended rule that says that the trial court needed to have made detailed findings of fact or provided multiple reasons. It just needed to state its reason on the record to provide useful guidance to the parties and provide for appellate review. And we know what we're here on today. Uh, we are here on Section 230 immunity. We'll rely on our brief for the remainder of our time. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Please, the court. Charles Barfield here, uh, co counsel with Mr. Little, and we represent Nathaniel White in this matter. Judges, I respectfully say that there's been, I don't know, uh, either a misstatement, but there's some clear, uh, I think, inaccurate statements regarding 230 as applied to this case. This case here, the appellant is arguing it is. Microsoft is a direct publisher, which excludes 230 from consideration. Uh, and the reason being, when I say direct publisher, uh, it is well established in the record, uh, and, I, and I will quote um, the record on pages 266, 276 and 277, where Microsoft, Microsoft says that it is undertaking efforts to remove the episode from his platform, and this is a letter from uh, to me from Microsoft co-counsel who's here, uh, Amy Housinger. Uh, 
Also on the record on page 314, uh, in response to one of our limited and scant discovery offers or omissions, uh, quote, Microsoft, we asked questions, and the issue is Microsoft offer for sale, the episode, I invited him in, in the series, Evil Lives Here, in the United States or globally. Microsoft responded, quote, that the episode at issue was able to be downloaded from the link provided, record 314. Now, what this means, Your Honor, is that this is linear distribution, meaning television. So you can stream or digital stream this program for a profit with Microsoft contracts with Disney, I'm sorry, Discovery, for a fee. They're not doing this because they like each other. This is a concerted action between two business and, and, and uh, entities. So therefore, this is not an internet situation per se. This is linear distribution from TV. You can stream things from your TV. Now, there, the, Microsoft has not admitted that, and they haven't given us all the discovery that we've been asking for. But the bottom line is that they use the word platforms in the letter to me, uh, and as well as what Mr. Little referred to early, uh, the letter to Mr. Webster. So the issue here is who has exclusive control? You're talking about creating the, the defamatory uh, product. Well, we say, the patent says that Microsoft, in a contractual agreement with Discovery, uh, they have mutual financial gain, mutual interest via contract. And because of that contract, it's that issue. Do, do, we, we, have any, do we have any record evidence of that? Well, we have, uh, in, a, in a related case, Discovery has uh, initially didn't provide a contract in the record. Uh, however, when it was convenient for Discovery in their motion for summary judgment, they did apply that um, contract to uh, in the record. We, as the appellants, asked this court to then make that a part of this record because the, the, this court could have taken judicial notice, but it said no. And, and, and perhaps the reason why we said no uh, was it was not before the trial court at the time of the summary judgment hearing, right? No, it was. It was before the trial court. In fact, Microsoft did initially was going to give us that contract. Um, and three months, they reneged on it. And this was in the record way before the trial court had that in, in her purview at the time. And then Discovery, through Mr. Webster, intervened and literally told uh, Ms. Hollinger and Microsoft lawyers, no, do not give the plaintiff or the appellant access to that uh, uh, contract because it's a uh, so-called trade secret. However, after litigation, then Mr. Webster, on his own initiative, filed it in the trial court record, uh, that contract. So we believe that the contract itself makes Microsoft and Discovery bound together. You can access this streaming on your television, which is traditional publication, which 230 does not deal with linear distribution. Okay, 230 is designed for internet, and they're, they keep using this word internet, but you can actually stream from your TV, from your phone, and we don't know how many other areas that Microsoft has said because they won't, they did not comply with a fundamental discovery, and I think is, it offends the notion of fundamental fairness when you have a billion dollar global company that don't even fully in good faith participate in discovery. And thank so you, thank many you, of the questions we have. Counsel, you're, you're a minute over your time. I'll let you sum up if, if you want to conclude briefly. I'm simply saying, uh, judges, that it's very difficult or concerning to me that if the discovery request that we have consistently tried to litigate in this case with motion to compel, and yet Microsoft has failed to comply with those discovery requests. So it's very, it's, it's easy for them to say, well, we don't have this, we don't have that. The point of any civil trial is to get information. If we can't get all the information 
and they have the information. It's very easy to say, well, the plaintiff or the patent can't prove this, this, or that. Thank you, counsel. Your time is expired. Thank you. Thank you both for your argument. That case is submitted, and we'll take a minute to uh, reset the, the courtroom for our second case. Yeah, yes, sir. If, you, if you'd like to, why don't, why don't we take a, a five-minute recess then? We'll stand in recess for five minutes. Thank you. All right. How you doing, sir? Good to see you. Good to see you. from running out of space. <coughs> a couple more retirements. And are you all using the um, attorney's lounge at all? We are. Um, in fact, all of the current judges yeah, and what they are in there now. Been, yeah. But, yeah. Um, I don't know what we're going to do when we run out of space. I've got to get Judge uh, Maycart and Judge Jay. I was about to say if they'll let me put a nail in the uh, the wood panels. somewhere else. Um, and, uh, switch to another one.
I know, I haven't seen him. He doesn't, he doesn't come over here and socialize. I haven't seen him in a couple of years. He he used to come every couple of months. But I haven't seen him in a little while. He's been in poor health. Has he? Yeah. Poor health. Still using Judge Davis's doilies. Yes, Please be seated. Okay, we're back in session on our second uh, case of the morning. Uh, that is White versus Discovery et al. Uh, 213629. Uh, uh, council ready to proceed on this one? Okay. And uh, Mr. Barfield, did you want to reserve some time for yeah, rebuttal on this? Minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. So noted. You can proceed when ready. Thank you. May it please the court, Charles Barford here, along with my esteemed um, colleague, uh, Mr. Joe Little, of Gainesville, Florida. We represent the appellate, uh, Nathaniel White, in this matter. The lower court, in this case, Your Honor, held that there was no personal jurisdiction over Red Marble on the Florida long arm statute and the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The appellant say through his lawyers that this was error. Article one, section two of Florida Constitution gives the appellant, Mr. White, a fundamental right to a jury trial. Now, we request that this court reverse and remand this case for further litigation. Red Marble is a producer of a television show, of uh, many shows, and it and is located in New York City. Red Marble Inter Ally produces the television shows to be sold, published, and distributed by the Discovery Communications LLC, which distributes its television shows nationwide, including Florida and globally. Under contract with Discovery, Red Marble produced television series, Eva Lives Here, and more specifically, the exact matter a program here is called I Invite Him In, that negligent depict the appellant, Mr. Nathaniel White of Florida, as a <coughs> gruesome killer of six uh, people in New York State. Mr. Nathaniel White, the appellant, has never, ever been in the state of New York. He's never been charged with murder. He's never killed anyone for the crime of murder. And I will submit to this court, fundamentally, what in America, in Florida, can a person be called worse than a serial killer? And Mr. White did hear that uh, publication of him being a serial killer. Now, the contract between Red Marble and Discovery, we believe, is concerted action. Uh, that's inseparable between Discovery and Red Marble. Both Red Marble and Discovery 
have a mutual $3 million identification clause or insurance liability agreement that will identify each mutually in case of a litigation verdict of that nature. You, you, you're we, speaking of, of red marble, and I understand your argument, but a, as to the individual defendants, Fitzpatrick, Dost, and Santos, all of the allegations against them are in the corporate capacity. So do you agree that they were there, – there's no personal jurisdiction over those three individuals? No, I wouldn't agree with that. Okay, I would why? say that uh, we, we – I'll, I'll cite some cases. Uh, we believe the, the supplemental case that we cited, Civil versus Levinston, I believe encompasses all the issues at, that's in, in this appeal here. Uh, and in that case, the court expressly stated that uh, executives of producing show can be personally liable in Florida. I think that's very clear. So I wouldn't agree with that premises based upon this case and this authority. Also, I believe when you look at the identification clause, um, that I think the, the bigger fundamental picture is uh, and we got a lot of cases we cite, and I know that you, you, you've read that. Uh, but what, what, what we're saying, the appellant, Mr. White, is saying in a very fundamental way, is that Red Marble created, produced, and distributed this defamatory product, and it was viewed in Florida. And just like if you had a, uh, a Japanese tire manufacturer, you know, uh, that uh, that uh, built tires for Ford, okay, and they decide to put that tire in the state of Florida, and some person in Florida get injured by that tire. This court, in any reasonable court, would not hesitate to think that that Japanese company will be held liable for selling a defective tire that injured a Florida resident. Can, can uh, I can I ask you then? That you're making the due process argument there, right? Yes. Under your due process argument, given that uh, Discover broadcasts throughout the, the U.S., any state would have sufficient minimum contacts uh, for the suit to be brought there? Is Correct. That, okay. Correct. And, uh, and, uh, and likewise, if you had a, a Dutch company that was selling bakeries uh, in Walmart, and if there was something defective with a cake that this Dutch company made in Walmart and one of the Florida citizens in any of the 67 counties in Florida goes to Walmart and eat that product, uh, you will, they, you, anyone will really respect that they will be called into court to litigate why this occurred and why was this injury you suppose there's before. any difference between the rules of law that apply to a products liability case and the rules of law that apply to defamation with respect to this particular issue? Well, I answer that just way if I think I'm reading your question correctly. Uh, defamation yeah, I, is always th those are Those are products court. liability cases. So why would we want to apply those in the defamation context? Well, defamation has always been an intentional tort on the floor. So therefore, uh, all the way, you know, for, for the last longest until they were statutorily approved. So, I mean, so... I, I would say that it's been a, a, a tension to it. Further, um, I think the Florida statute is very clear that this particular crime, it, it, he, we saying defamation uh, is, in, is when it's defamation per se. When you talk about a heinous crime, such as if you if you if you say a person is of a sexual immorality, a person is a criminal, a person did a, a heinous crime. So clearly, uh, I don't even think that's in dispute whether or not this would occur. So whether it's, it was negligent or probability, I think it would be the same legal principle. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. For, to, to satisfy the, the long-arm statute, there, there's got to be, the, the tort's got to be committed in Florida, right? So uh, there has to be broadcast of the episode in Florida. Besides Mr. White's affidavit where he said, somebody told me that they saw uh, this episode in, in Florida. Is there any record evidence that the episode was, was Yes, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that question. There is record evidence. There is a stipulation that Red Marble, and through his counsel, in particular these, Red Marble and uh, all the producers that I named earlier, agreed in that stipulation 
that um, uh, that they knew when they created this program that they were creating it with the hope that discovery would uh, broadcast it naturally, in which would naturally includes the state of Florida. So that's it. I, that alone is raising up the locator in terms of these producers. They knew, uh, and plus. Um, the fact that it matters is that. So we don't need any actual evidence of publication in Florida if, as long as we have evidence of maybe intent to publish in Florida? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it was published in Florida. And they knew that it was going to, when they created it, the question is, is when Red Marble producers created this program, um, they created it not because they was nice, they created for business interest to make money. Money for Red Marble, money for Discovery. Through that business entity, this defamatory product was created. When it was created, it was distributed in Florida. Uh, and, and they have admitted this in their interrogatory discovery of Red Marble uh, 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 that they um, you know, uh, did uh, distribute this, uh, published this communications uh, twice that we know of in their interrogatories or their admissions. So that's in the record. So. Um, so I, it's not a dispute about the publication. I believe that, and I don't want to make their argument, but I think their position is is that um, the courts doesn't have personal jurisdiction under the long arm statute or through due process. We reject that because that's wrong. Because I think that uh, the case that uh, I what cited was, uh, was that stipulation that you're talking about. Um, was that before the trial court at the time of the hearing for the motion to dismiss? Yes, it was. Your um, initial brief uh, seems to claim some sort of joint venture between uh, the Appleys and Discover. Uh, was was that pleaded and fleshed out below? Was it was there <coughs> facts of that presented to the trial court? Well, that's interesting that you asked that question, Judge. And we're saying that appellate appellant position is that we have tried to, uh, in the scant discovery we got, we have tried to. Uh, uh, plead according to the scant discovery we got. And so there is evidence that uh, there is a contract. They have admitted that there's a contract between discovery and red marble. Uh, that's in the record. Um, uh, they have identification clause uh, that's in the record, uh, 1326, I believe. Um, so we believe that um, they are Clearly, Red Marvin Discovery tied together in, in other ways. They have the same uh, law firm and same lawyer, Carsten Fields. And if they were so independent, you wouldn't have <laughs> the same appellees represented by the same lawyer or the same law firm, because that could be a conflict for interest, given the fact that you have a $3 million policy. Just say if this case naturally goes to a jury, and a jury finds that one the one appellee is liable for eight million dollars, one liable for four million dollars. Well, the the mutual identification is only three million dollars. So now you have a conflict of interest. So therefore, because you have the same counsel, same law firm representing all the well most of the appellees, that's problematic. Very problematic. And so we tried to get the uh the contract into uh, this court for judicial notice because of the fact that the lawyer, Mr. Webster, did file it eventually. When it suited him good, he did file it. But then, um, so I don't know why this court would not want to have all the information before it. I think it's a matter of fundamental fairness to Mr. White. Mr. White deserved a right to a jury trial. That's what we're talking about here. This, this is not an intellectual exercise. This is a real person that could have been killed the fact his neighbor threatened him because he saw this program on television, not the computer. He saw it and other witnesses that's in the record saw this and we have affidavits in the record that he had eyewitnesses that his fiance that was attacked with a gun. And my theory, my reality is that it doesn't take a bad person with bad intention but one time to possibly kill you. And when you have a global company like this with 80 million distribution uh, subscribers, and then they also have non-subscribers, 
They have non-subscribers, too. So we don't really know. But what we're talking about here, sir, about Red Marble and these defendants, that we're not talking about Discover, right? Uh, additionally, you're, you're two minutes into your rebuttal time, but you can keep going if you like. No, I'm going I'm to I'm stop for okay. just a little. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Maybe having technical difficulties here, Mr. Webster. Yeah, it's it's okay. I'll work with what I have. <coughs> may it, <coughs> excuse me. May it please the court, Peter Webster for Applebee's. <coughs> um, let me start by saying that um, almost all of what Mr. Barfield just represented to you as facts in this case does not appear anywhere in the record. I think uh, he may have be confusing his records between this appeal and the appeals they've taken from the summary judgments in favor of Discovery and Amazon that are pending in this court, uh, but are completely different cases. Um, <clears throat> most of what he's told you is just not in this record. Um, <clears throat> in particular, um, he repeatedly referred to an indemnification provision. There is no evidence of an indemnification provision in this record. He said he thought it was at page 1326 of the record. The record in this case doesn't go that high. <clears throat> um, he talked about the um, contract between uh, discovery and red marble providing evidence of concerted action. Of course, the contract between discovery and red marble is not a part of this record. Um, <clears throat> it's not a part of this record um, for one reason and one reason only, and that's because the plaintiff refused to sign a confidentiality agreement in order to get those documents. Um, in our response to their request for production, we said that the contract documents were trade secrets, but that we would produce them if they would sign a confidentiality agreement. They refused to do that. Um, we twice subsequently um, told them that if they would simply, one of their lawyers would sign the confidentiality agreement, would give them the contract documents. There's a letter from me to Mr. Barfield um, dated August 13th, 2021 at page 661 of the record um, that at the bottom of page one and the top of page two says precisely that. In addition, um, there's an email from me to Mr. Little, Mr. Barfield's co-counsel, dated August 17th, 2021, um, that says the same thing, and that appears at page 664 of the record. Can I, can I jump you ahead, Mr. Yes. Professor, to the, uh, the, the two, two different issues, the long-arm statute and the, the minimum contacts sure. or the due process requirement? On the long-arm statute, um, assuming that the broadcast was defamatory, wasn't a tort committed in Florida, uh, when the uh, broadcast was made available uh, here in Florida? Well, my clients, Red Marble and, and Messrs. Uh, Fitzpatrick, Dost, and Santos, never broadcast anything in Florida. They were responsible for the production of the program. In their affidavits, they all said they had nothing whatsoever to do with the broadcast of the episode in Florida or anywhere else, and Red well, Marble. Why is, it, why is it not enough that they knew at the time they produced it, though, that they were uh, that it was with the intent that it be distributed nationally? They knew it was going to be distributed nationally. Well, they, I think the only evidence in the record is the stipulation that said they hoped it would be <coughs> distributed. Uh, they didn't know that. There's no evidence in the record they had any control 
over whether the episode would be broadcast, where it would be broadcast, or when it would be broadcast. What did they produce it for then? Um, they produced it because they were being paid to produce it. <laughs> Um, the, but but I mean, were, the, the fact that they expected it to be broadcast nationally, uh, aren't they then on, on the due process side purposely availing themselves of any forum within the United States? Um, no, I think the, the law is clearly to the contrary, except um, Mr. Barfield agreed with you that that was, that was the, the case. Um, the law, I think you'll find, <coughs> is to the effect that under the Calder um, effects test, before one can be uh, subjected to personal jurisdiction for posting or publishing allegedly defamatory comments, um, it has to be established that the comments were expressly aimed at the, at the forum seeking to exercise jurisdiction You'll find, I believe, in Estes versus Roden, um, which is cited a number of times uh, in our answer brief, uh, a third district court of appeal case from 2018, written by Judge Lagoa, um, that on page um, pages 197 and 198 of that opinion, she cites f several federal appellate cases. Um, all of which hold that, um, that simply because something is available on a website doesn't submit the posters to jurisdiction anywhere in the country where that website might be accessed. Um, well, well, that's different than what we have here, right? Where you have, uh, I mean, the stipulation says that they hoped and expected that it was going to be broadcast nationally. Certainly. The state of Florida would be within uh, the scope of nationally, right? Well, e even if that were true, and I submit it's not, the problem we have, first of all, with regard to long-arm jurisdiction, um, is that even if that were true, all that would do is satisfy the posting element. There's still a requirement of accessibility in Florida, and it has to be actually accessed by someone other than the plaintiff in Florida. There's no evidence, no admissible evidence in this record to establish either accessibility in Florida or that it was actually accessed in Florida. Um, the only evidence of that is the affidavit filed one business day, and I use affidavit uh, loosely, filed one business day before the hearing on the motion to dismiss. The affidavit is pure hearsay um, by the plaintiff. In addition, it's not sworn to. Uh, we objected on both of those grounds. The, the trial judge, Judge Dempsey, um, granted the motion to dismiss for all of the reasons uh, in our written materials and in our argument at the hearing. Um, so we have to assume that she agreed that that affidavit was inadmissible because it was pure hearsay and it wasn't sworn to. Other than that, there's no evidence of either access or accessibility. Um, Mr. Barfield said um, that, that that was admitted um, in answers to interrogatories. If you look at page 12 of their initial brief, um, you will see, and, and these are discoveries answers to interrogatories, not red marbles, not the individual defendants. You'll see uh, in their initial brief at page 12, um, they quote from discoveries answers to interrogatories, and um, in at least two places on that page, it says discovery has no information that provides a breakdown of the total number of subscribers by state. So there is nothing in the answers, even in Discovery's answers to interrogatories, um, that provides um, any indication that this was accessible or accessed um, in Florida. Um, with regard to um, the 
due process aspect, the, the law is quite clear, um, I think at least, that um, the Calder effects test is the controlling test. It's based on um, the 1984 decision of Calder versus Jones, as um, clarified by the 2014 decision in uh, Walden versus Fiore. Under those cases, it's perfectly clear that in order for a state to exercise jurisdiction in a defamation case like this, the def defamatory material must be specifically targeted at the forum state and the individual. There's no evidence that that was the case here. On the contrary, their complaint alleges that this, was, this episode was not about the plaintiff. It was about a serial killer in New York who had the same name. The episode doesn't focus on Florida. It focuses on New York State. <clears throat> and so there's, there's nothing in the episode to suggest any kind of targeting of plaintiff. Their whole case is based on the fact that for roughly three seconds at the end of an hour-long episode, a 25-year-old Florida Department of Corrections photograph of their client appears with no identifying information regarding it. Um, it, it Does know, the Calder effects test apply when it, 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 Calder, as I recall, there, there was some in, intentionality involved in trying to defame the person. This one, I don't believe there's been any allegation that they intentionally swapped out the photos or tried to de defame. This was negligent at best, uh, so or perhaps reckless. But uh, is, is, does that have any difference, uh, the, the intent in Calder versus negligent or reckless uh, here? Um, Your Honor, I, I, if anything, it makes it even less likely that there's jurisdiction in Florida. But in Calder, they said for a defamation case, the key to a finding of jurisdiction is that the def defamatory activities were deliberately aimed at the form state and at the plaintiff. You remember, um, Miss Jones, the actress, Shirley Jones, was the subject of the defamatory article that was written uh, by the National Enquirer and published in California. Um, the, the, the writer uh, had obtained uh, considerable information from the story from California. Here, we obviously, we have none of that. We have an affidavit that says, Nobody got anything or did any work in producing this episode that had anything to do with Florida. And the reason for that is obvious, because it's about a New York serial killer. Um, there's no evidence that, that anything that was done in this case had any connection of any sort whatsoever with Florida. Um, so so under the- as, as far as the, the due process prong, Judge Winokur had mentioned uh, earlier the, some of the products liability cases, uh, the Ford Motor uh, and Collette uh, from uh, the Georgia uh, District Court uh, were both cited. Uh, do, do, do those products liability cases have any bearing on what we're doing here? <clears throat> they don't, Your Honor, because products liability is different from defamation. In Collette, um, the court um, expressly um, distinguished an 11th Circuit decision involving uh, a defamation. Uh, in, in, and in Colette, which is a products liability case, uh, the court noted that the companies that were selling the product in Georgia were affiliated companies, and it pointed to the contract between the, the manufacturer and the distributors to demonstrate that this was a concerted activity. We, ha we don't have that here. We have no evidence that there was a concerted activity here. On the contrary, the only evidence we have is the affidavit by Red Marble's president, which is to the effect that Red Marble uh, is an independent 
producer of television of programs it does not broadcast uh, or distribute programs and and under the law the the long arm statute must be strictly construed but the 14th amendment due process test is an even stricter test if either one of them is not satisfied then this case has to be affirmed. But on top of that, we have the corporate shield issue with regard to the three individual defendants. Um, there's nothing to suggest any of them did anything in Florida or that they did anything independently of their corporate capacity. Um, Mr. Mr. Barfield cited the supplemental authority in Silver versus Levenstein, uh, Levinson, that they filed um, five days ago. Um, in that case, the court noted that they were the defendant was not asserting the corporate shield defense, but even if he had, he would have failed because the allegations of the complaint were that the defendant himself, who was a lawyer sent the allegedly defamatory letter from Connecticut to Florida where it was received. And under the corporate shield doctrine, um, and the case from this court um, on that issue, Your Honor, is Lafreniere versus Craig Myers. It's in our answer brief, uh, 2018 decision from this court where um, Judge Brad Thomas uh, said that in order for there to be jurisdiction um, with regard to officers or employees of a corporation, the activity must actually impact Florida. It must be targeted at Florida. And he actually, he actually um, cited the Calder case. And Mr. Webster, you're a minute and a half past Thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we give uh, Professor a little uh, extra minute to... May it please the court, I'm Joe Little, representing Appellate White, along with Mr. Barfield. Uh, Your Honors, in terms of particular evidence of publication in Florida, uh, we have in the record the, uh, the affidavits of Mr. Dukes, uh, who viewed the program, gave an affidavit that he did, we have affidavits of uh, Tammy Williams uh, to the same effect and the affidavit of a third person whose name I can't recall. That is in the uh, record of this case. <clears throat> you, uh, you, Your Honor, the liability of Red Marble comes as the fact that it was in a concerted action with Discovery to produce and publish this episode. And the court has already acknowledged or made the point that the uh, red marble not only hoped but expected. Expected means a very high probability uh, that the thing would go. Red marble was involved in a concerted action to produce this thing to be shown throughout the United States and the world. Uh, and it was produced everywhere uh, in the United States uh, and the world. And this matter is just like <clears throat> the concerted action, common law concerted action in, in section 786 of the restatement comment E, which is almost a perfect model of what we have here about parties involved in an activity to do something collectively, and that's what was done in this case. So we don't have to, Mr. White doesn't have to uh, deal with specific uh, connection. This is a general connection. This thing was everywhere. Just like Discovery, it's everywhere. So was Red Marble, everywhere in the country, including in Florida. Uh, <clears throat> Do, do you have, Professor, the, the record side perhaps for Dukes and Little? This, this Maybe I missed it, but this is the first time I'm, 
I'm hearing of that. The, the Dukes and Little Affidavit that you contend that they were, uh, they said that they viewed the uh, publication in Florida. Your Honor, I'm sorry, I didn't the, the, quite. The, I, I was looking, you, you mentioned here in rebuttal uh, affidavit from someone I think named Dukes and someone Dukes, yes. named Williams, where they contend that they viewed the. They uh, viewed it, yes. Where I, in the record is that? I, I may have missed that. Your Honor, it's, uh, I can provide you that. I can't do it. Well, right I, that's okay. That's okay. At, at this moment. Uh, <clears throat> Your Honor, in terms of the expressly aimed criterion, if in fact you accept the theory of our case, which is we had a concerted action, these people were to tie together to do this project and, and uh, convey it throughout the United States, including Florida, <clears throat> then in fact the thing was expressly aimed to Florida. It was expressly aimed everything, everywhere. This is like the Hustler case. And in Hustler, the Supreme Court of the United States said, in effect, that the plaintiff could sue anywhere, including in New Hampshire, where he didn't live, and where there were only 15 or 20,000 uh, subscribers to Hustler, because it was everywhere. And this is a, an affarciary case. This is not New Hampshire. This is Florida, Your Honors, as you know. And we have many more. We believe, although Discovery and Red Marble never told us, many no more subscribers in Florida than there were of Hustler in New Hampshire. Uh, Your Honor, I think my time is up. Yes, sir. Uh, so we respectfully request that this court should reverse. Uh, we also I believe that the issue should reverse on procedural grounds that I stated in the other case. And let me also say, Your Honors, you've asked me about uh, uh, some things I think that really are not the question here, as you know, is, is jurisdiction. It's, it's not whether it's defamatory or anything else, it's jurisdiction. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you all, counsel. Thank you for your arguments today. With that, the court is adjourned. All right.